my name is Gianni Russo, a.k.a. Carlo, the infamous son-in-law from The Godfather. I'm now known as the Hollywood Godfather, and this is my story. Walking with a limp like, will I ever run? Once again, or is this it? Am I forever done? Living in the hospital was never fun. Some people were cool, but not everyone. Hi everyone, it's Jeannie, co-host of the Hollywood Godfather podcast. Today's show is part two of our interview with attorney John Nail. On today's episode, we're sharing a television interview where Mr. Nail gives us an in-depth look at the case against his client and his efforts to get him freed after 35 years of incarceration. You can share our show by clicking the three dots at the top right-hand side of our page. For more information about this case, as well as a link to donate towards DNA experts, click the link in the show notes. We'll be back next week with a new show. Hit the follow button so you never miss an episode. We'll see you soon. Hello and welcome to the Rullet and Baldacci Report. The report today, the incredible case of Dennis Deshane. Over 30 years ago, three decades, one of the most brutal murders in Maine history took place of a young girl around the age of 12. And the case that followed is still going on today, three decades later, more than three decades. Because they arrested one Dennis Deshane, because they were absolutely convinced, in their minds, beyond any doubt, the police, the state of Maine prosecutors, that Dennis Deshane had committed this horrible, brutal murder. However, over the years, many people, many people, including uh, a lawyer who is now a judge and a detective who did a book about Dennis Deshane, were convinced that this man was totally innocent of this horrible and heinous crime. Rob, our guest. We're very pleased to have uh, John Nail, attorney in Waterville. John happens to be my, my cousin. Uh, but don't hold that against either of you. Don't hold, don't that, hold against that against you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But John has a, a very distinguished uh, career in, uh, in the law, uh, having tried many murder cases along, along, the, uh, along his uh, career, uh, most recently working with his uh, brother and nephew, correct, uh, yes. John, on elder law. Uh, and, uh, and you've taken this case on, John, uh, pro bono, Yes. And you've been involved in this case for a long time, but what brings you to, to us today? What's significant that you would like to talk about? Uh, just the fact that the man is innocent, yep. and that over the last 35 years, he has been trying to prove himself innocent with uh, more DNA testing that he asked for 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. We finally have that DNA test results, and we think that those results show even more that he's innocent. Uh, at the time, uh, back in 1988, when he was first arrested, yes, you're right, Derry. The, the prosecutor and the detectives, they all thought that he was the man. Right he off was the, bat. the one who did it right off the bat. What they were acting on there was they were acting on circumstantial evidence. Uh, it is our theory now of the case, now that we have as much of the evidence that we're ever going to have because there's no more DNA to be testing, right. the state destroyed the other evidence years ago that could have also contained exculpatory DNA why evidence. Did they, why yeah, did they destroy, gonna, yeah. John? I'm yeah, why, why, would, why would they do that, well, John? Well, well there, is a, there is a time after a trial, like there was in this case back in 1989, I think it's about five or six years that the clerk of court can destroy the evidence without objection. Well, in this case, as a part of, matter of course. As a matter of course. But in this case, the attorney at the time, Tom Connolly, yeah because appeals were still pending. He objected to the destruction of the evidence, and he was able himself to go to the courtroom and thankfully, thankfully, take control of some of the evidence. And, that's the, and, that, and that is the evidence that we have now that was recently tested for DNA. The rest of the evidence, a rape kit that was destroyed, other evidence was destroyed. Yeah. We, we were just left now right. with seven pieces of crime scene evidence 
that we have been able to just recently have DNA test results on. Uh, John, uh, when Tom, a very able attorney, uh, who also ran for governor of the state of Maine, uh, uh, when Tom took that evidence and you know kept it, I'm sure in a safe place, has the state raised the problem of, hey, that evidence left the courthouse, it's no good now, it's got tainted by the defense attorney. Have they raised that problem? Yes, they did. They what happened with that? They did do that. So, like, uh, let's see. The items of evidence in the case that are today instrumental was uh, the, the uh, blood that was found on the, all ten of the victim's fingernails when she was um, buried at the scene. We have photos of her hands with the blood caked underneath her fingernails. That is the blood of the assailant. Now, at the outset, at the outset, at the trial back in 1989, all we could, all that could be done for, for blood tests then was a serology type blood test. What do you mean by that? Blood yeah. typing, A, B, A, O, oh, okay? That's okay. all that could be done, exclusionary type evidence. Mm -hmm. So when the evidence, when, when the blood from the fingernails was, was tested, it came out as being uh, A-type blood. Deshane is O-type blood. The victim had A-type blood, so they thought that it was all her blood. Now through, D, now through DNA testing, we're seeing that the blood that is under her fingernails has an unknown male DNA. We're not talking about just DNA off, uh, off a fingernail. We're talking about DNA that came from blood that from was blood. on the, all 10 of her fingers, fingernails. And, and John, your point is gonna be, I assume, there's no way that this girl would have 10 fingers with uh, blood underneath it, that that came from, and you demonstrated this earlier, and I'd like to have you do it again. Yeah, please, take that us through that. You demonstrated what, that, 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 that this man, was. she was scratching everywhere, on his face, wherever, uh, because she still had her hand. Go ahead and explain yeah, that. Explain I, yeah, explain. The blood what under happened? the fingernails was explained to the jury as being her own blood. Right. Okay, now, but, now that, and, and, and it came from the limited amount of blood that she had up here from some scratches that she had up on her neck. Okay, so at the time of trial, believing that it was the victim's blood, the defense really didn't get too involved in that, okay? There was a lot of evidence that could have been explored if we had known that it was not her blood. Right, right. But that type of evidence was overlooked. Now that we know that it's not her blood, and we look at how her hands were found at, at the time of of We've got that picture, by the way. Do you we know? do. We've got yes, that, that would be good. That would be good if we had and, the and, picture. And you submitted that picture Along with your with, motion. Exactly. And because that picture of of those hands, which are actually hers, uh, very I, I hated to very see it. Very graphic. John, but the, but you're saying that, that picture was so important to you that you put that picture in in, uh, in absolute, your motion. Absolutely, yeah. because it shows blood under her fingernails that would have come from her only defense mechanism at the time as the assailant was tying the scarf that came from Mr. Deshane's truck. At the, at the time he was trying, tying the scarf to strangle the victim with her hands up here, he missed going at, uh, tying it around the neck the first time. The first knot was tied up because here. Because she's struggling, I assume. Because she's struggling and she could push it up. Yep. The second time when he wrapped the scarf around the poor girl's neck, now he caught it down here. And that's where the final knot was tied. And her hands were found here up under her chin, tied. With the new DNA evidence, now we can, we can show through crime scene reconstruction that as he was tying that scarf around her neck and her hands up here, she dug him. She dug him, she dug him either in the face, because she could reach up to the face, to the neck, to his arms, or to his hands. Whoever committed the crime left the scene that night with 10 dig marks on them. Somewhere. Somewhere, face, neck, hands, or arms. That's how the blood gets under her fingernails. Right. 
Now, if, if you could please show the photo that was taken of Mr. DeShane. This is important, this photo Ex too. You, you exactly. also submitted this photo, Ex which, the by photo. the way, John, when you showed me the, your, your motion, and I'm reading it, and I go, geez, why would, why would he include a picture of this defendant? But when you explained it, which we'll, the audience is looking at. Explain when yeah. it was taken, John. Yeah, go ahead, John. Okay, so the photo that we have of him, and I don't know if it's being shown. Yeah, it'll be up there. It will be. But, but you would see the photo of him. It looks like he really just got out of the shower. Right. There's not a scratch on him. Normal. There's no dirt on him. His hair isn't messed up. His clothing hasn't been stretched. It's not dirty. And for sure, he doesn't have 10 dig marks on him. Anywhere. The police, the police relied solely on the circumstantial evidence and the fact that the body was found in an area that he had been at that day. That's their circumstantial evidence that they have. And we're saying that that's not enough. But John, tell us about that circumstantial evidence. Uh, the, the rope, uh, the, 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 the thing with his name on it. That's, that's, what, that's what, quote, killed him. Uh, and exactly. Tell us about that. He, he, he was framed. He was framed by the real assailant. What we're saying there is... How is was that, he framed? Yeah. He, he was framed be, uh, when the assailant went into his parked vehicle and took certain items from the vehicle. Two items in particular. One was his... his this man was a young farmer. Nonviolent farmer, nothing. Uh, uh, he carried along a no notebook of his farm activities with his name on it. And then because he had his truck in the repair shop, there was a repair bill in there with his name on it. Who, the assailant, the killer, rifled his truck, took those two pieces of evidence, took the scarf, and then took rope from his truck. From his, then the assailant went and got the victim. Now, whether it's random, serial killer type thing, or whether it's a person who had a motive, a purpose, we don't know that. But we do know that the victim was taken from the place where she was babysitting at, which was three and a half miles away from where she was buried. The assailant took the items from Dennis DeShane's truck, went to the home where she was, again, either randomly or with purpose, and planted the, the notebook and the, and the repair bill in the driveway, took the victim back to where the crime scene was, three and a half miles away where Dennis's truck was parked, took the victim and struggled with her, I imagine, all of the time. She's not going voluntarily to do this. She's struggling. He's, the, the, the assailant is struggling now with a 12-year-old scared girl. And he's got to control her all the time. So he must have parked the vehicle and then he had to struggle with her in one way or another to get her 500 feet into the woods. Through, and, through sticks and... Heavily and, wooded area. Yeah, as, shrubs and stuff. Exactly, yeah. exactly. All that I'm telling you is everything that's in the record. Right. It's right. in the record. Right. They testified to You're this. You're not making any of this up. Heavily wooded area, 500 feet in the woods. Right. That would have caused some type of change in the man's clothing or his skin or his face or his head, nothing. Then when they got to the scene, they, there's evidence again of there being an area where there was a wrestling type of a thing taking place. So that must have been the area where now they're both down on the ground and he's exercising control over her. Again, that's gonna cause dirt and stains on the clothing. Yes, of course. And then when he finally gets control over the victim now, he's, gonna, he's sitting on her, he's straddling her to gain control over her body and to keep her in one place and then as he's on top of her, he's tied the hands, and now he's got the scarf, and he's going to do the strangulation process with the scarf, and that's when he's there for the length of period of time, and she has the time, finally. The only thing that she can do in her defense is dig. Use, yeah. And when we found her, or when she was found, she was, she was buried above ground burial, right? Yep. And, and uh, when they found her, again, they found her like this. And that's what rigor mortis will do. Rigor mortis freezes you. 
in the, in, the, in the condition and the pose that you were in when you died. And the rigor mortis shows. As a result of the rigor mortis, we see that her hands were found up here, tied, and, and there's the knot. The strangulation knock is here, knot is here, yep. her hands are here, and then whoever did it, his hands are right there too, and his face is right there too. Right. Horrific. So that's what it is. Uh, Horrific. Go ahead. No, I mean, this, this is chilling, John, and uh, uh, why has it, what makes this different, uh, this attempt to, to uh, have a new hearing makes it different than what the previous attempts have been? Is it the new technology or, or what, John? What? Well, yeah, why do you have a chance, for example? Well, uh, like the new DNA test results yes. now show that the D there's DNA on the scarf that can be compared to or match the DNA now found under the 10 fingernails, okay? So now we have uh, unknown male DNA blood under the fingernails, and now we have unknown male DNA on the scarf. But not Deshane's. But not Deshane. Deshane's is on the scarf you because got two it's places, his. You got two places with DNA. Exactly. And the scarf has been in, the scarf has been in Deshane's truck. Will they argue then the DNA is somebody that was in the truck and picked it up? I mean. They're arguing even worse than that. Worse? They're that, arguing that even good. worse than Go that. Go ahead. That, that when, was all right. When, when DNA, uh, when the unknown male DNA showed up on the blood under the fingernails, okay, rightly so, the prosecution at that time said, look, that could be contamination. Right. And so then the state, uh, so then the prosecutor and the defense counsel at the time says, okay, so this is what we're going to do. If you're, thinking it's, if you're thinking it's contamination, we're going to get a sample of everybody's DNA in the crime lab, everybody's DNA in her family, everybody's DNA that we think who could have even come close to that scar. To that. And it came up empty. They came up. Oh, my God. Nothing. Okay, oh. yeah. so then what they did was, <laughs> so now in order to explain it, now what the state does is, now the state blames it on their crime lab. Oh my God. They throw the crime lab under the bus I by saying, hey, look, look, our crime lab must have been so dirty. Yeah, that they contaminated it. That it got contaminated. <laughs> they throw their yeah. own crime lab under the bus <laughs> in order to again defend. Right, right. John, there's one, element that you talked about that reminded Rob and I of somebody that you met first in the state of Maine, became friends with him, F. Lee Bailey, mm -hmm. who wrote a book that Rob and I interviewed him on, thanks to Rob. Last interview with F. Lee Bailey was where he discussed evidence that he would have produced, that they would have produced, that when O.J. Simpson got on the plane, supposedly after a brutal murder, he's talking to the pilot, hey, good to see you, oh, signing autographs, hello acting totally, quote, normal. And the forensic scientist that Bailey was gonna bring was gonna testify, if unless you are Bundy, a serial killer that's killed hundreds of people, that any ordinary man that has killed a person brutally is not gonna be normal. And you've got that evidence from the elderly people that picked him up in the car. Tell us about that. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh uh, John, I think it might be helpful if you kind of trace back yeah. the, the steps uh, of Dennis Duchesne, what he was doing uh, during the course of the days. Uh, and then meets the people, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank, you. thank you, Rob. Yeah. Okay, okay, very good. So uh, uh, Dennis is a, uh, at the time, he was a young man coming down into Bowdoin to start a farm with his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, he was born and raised in Madawaska. Right. His mom and dad died when he was young. He put himself through college twice. He went to college first in agriculture and then again in French. Mm -hmm. He married his wife, came back to Maine, went down into Bowdoin, bought a small place, uh, uh, raising animals and vegetables. And uh, because, he, because he's totally a nonviolent person, when it comes to uh, 
slaughtering his own animals, he doesn't do that. He takes them to, he takes his chickens down to the slaughterhouse and they do it for him and then he picks the chicken up and takes it home. He cannot do that himself. So that day, July 6th, after just coming back from a family gathering in, in Madawaska with his family for the 4th of July, he came back July 6th. He's now going to go pick up the, the chicken that he had slaughtered, okay, the chicken meat. And he did in Gardner. He came home that day, brought, his chick, uh, brought, the, brought the chicken meat home, and he told his wife that he was going to go out and look for different places to go fishing. But in fact, he was leaving so that he could go and, and get high on an amphetamine drug. And his wife did not approve of that. That's why he had to leave the house. Mm -hmm. So he left the house and he drove to this deserted area, back roads in Bowdoin, and he parked his vehicle there. He left, went into the woods, did the drug thing, got high, sat there, walked around, and he got lost. He got lost. He came out on another road. He came out on the other road at about 8 o'clock at night. He'd been there, how about how many hours do you think he was hanging around in the woods? Five or six hours. Five or six hours hanging around in the woods. Exactly. Wow. Lost. Lost. High. Lost Hi. in the woods, Autobot. but he yep. comes out yep. looking as he looked in, in the that picture, picture that we just saw. Which is normal. Which is normal. And now he's met by an older couple who stop and ask him if, he, if he's lost or does he need anything. And he says, yes, I'm looking for my vehicle. Mm -hmm. They invited him into, his, into their car. They then invited him into their house. These people testify? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And they, and they testified he's, he's acting normal. Exactly. Look, just like he looked in the photo that we just saw. Not a scratch on him. Not a scratch on him. But what you have is, is that while he's looking for his truck, you have, you have the, the, the sheriff and the detectives now looking for a missing girl. Yes. Right? Because she was taken from where she was babysitting. Right. She was taken from that home sometime between 1230 and, and here 3. he is right in the area. And here he is. He's right in the area. Yeah, no doubt about it. Right in yep. the area. And then they find those items in the, in the uh, driveway of the home where the, where the victim was taken. Which in itself to me would be strange. Why would somebody take a girl and leave a, a, a yeah. truck repair bill and a, I mean, it's, it's Ralph, crazy. You see, that, that point that you just made, John, when you say that this guy picks items out of the truck, and now he's obviously planning to, to, to frame, frame somebody, yeah. and probably not knowing who not John know is, exactly. Dennis DeShane is, Never. but he picks, but, but that's the thing, is Rob just picked out, you pick out a, 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 a notebook with a name on it, and why, if you just were going to go rape some girl, why would that notebook just be fall out of your pocket, whatever? And if you were going to rape and, and, and boom, would you be pretty careful, would you not, not to leave? He left, what, four items? The scarf? Two items. Yeah. He left two items in the, in the dooryard. Yeah, two okay. items in the dooryard. And, he, and then he had uh, the assailant, then had the other two items with him, the so scarf we, and the rope. So, uh, yep. John, it is, it, it is so, so it's like a, de a detective novel. Yes, the detective, oh, here's the notebook, are we getting? So you're saying that they jumped on that instead of even contemplating that he was framed. That's what concerns me, that they did not contemplate that this man had been framed. They did not, in spite of the fact that the man voluntarily. Yeah, explain this, this is The important. man voluntarily surrendered his body for photos Surrendered his blood for, for blood testing. Right. Uh, surrendered his uh, fingerprints. Surrendered his clothing for them to take. Surrendered his truck for them to take. Surrendered his home for, him, for them to go into and take sheets off his bed and other clothing that they might have had. Cut his fingernails to see if he had any blood or debris under his fingernails. None. And he volunteered all of it. And then before the trial, He's volunteering, he's begging for DNA test results to be done that he would pay for. He's, he's, pay for. He's begging. Begging. For, for, first of all, John, I think the three of us can agree that if we were accused, the three of us right here, 
of a heinous crime that we know we did not commit under any circumstances, killing our wives or best friends or whatever. You're right, John, if you didn't do it, the first thing you'd be saying to people, at least I would be, take any DNA you want. Take whatever uh, you want. Uh, by the way, John, uh, the other thing I, I would ha have no hesitation doing if, if I was accused of a crime I didn't do, it. give me a polygraph. Did he ever take a polygraph? No, he never did. Did anybody ever think about, about that possibility? Uh, I didn't. I didn't, well, and I don't even You're coming in 35, 35 years later. Right. I mean, first There's of all, There's no John, reason for him to take that risk like that, because we know that the lie detector tests are not as accurate. But, they're but not John, allowed in court. But, Correct. John, I know they're not allowed in court, but my, my, my law firm and F. Lee Bailey use polygraph. We use polygraphs. So if somebody comes into our office and they're accused of some, you know, abuse of their stepdaughter, let's say, and they adamantly deny it. Oh, I've never touched her. Well, this happened, that happened. No. We often say, will you take a polygraph? And, and we hire the polygraph guy. Nobody can find out about it. It's, it's privileged. And so I'm just wondering, would, it, it, would you ever consider the possibility just of getting a private polygraph test? Nobody knows about it. You can do it. And just to see if he, because when, when we have had clients pass the polygraph. I don't see the need for it, Derry. Yeah. I don't see the need for it. Yeah. DNA is much more reliable oh, but, than the yeah. polygraph. Elaborate on that, John. And here he is. He's, he's begging for the DNA test results. I have to say that that, that really points to credibility, in my opinion. Because if you say to somebody, I'll give you anything you want, fingerprints, I have to say, because you, you used a word trace one is circumstantial, the other was trace. Tell the audience what the difference is between trace evidence and circumstantial. Good question. Well, the big difference between trace evidence and circumstantial evidence is that circumstantial evidence can be placed there. Right. right. With trace evidence, uh, if there's trace evidence there, you have had to be there. Trace evidence is the type of evidence that comes from our body. Fingerprints, blood, serum, spit, I was Seaman. just going to say, if he Hair. spit or he All urinated or whatever, I mean, if All he did something that. about himself there, that would prove that he was there. In other words, Turned some evidence that he left there, his hair, whatever. Exactly, right? exactly. So that, so, so, so you have the lack of the trace evidence, and then you have him begging to do the DNA evidence, and then you have the, the photo of him. The that shows that, that, that his physical appearance was not changed at all. If a man went through and did what he did, you're going to see some trace. Dirt on his pants. Dirt something. on his pants. She was buried above ground. Mm -hmm. The man had to use his bare hands when he did that. Nothing. They took, they cut his fingernails to see if they had any debris under the fingernails. Right. Nothing. Right. And the other thing is, John, is if you had just carried on this unbelievably brutal crime and you're still somewhat high on the with drugs, and to a little old lady and a little old gentleman, probably my age, uh, say, you want to ride? You're going to say no. You're not going to, you're not, you're not going to want to deal with people. Exactly. You're not going to sit down and shoot the, shoot the bull in, in, in their car. Shortly after and brutalizing somebody, yeah. And they testified that, they, that he, they, they asked him questions. Where are you going? What are you doing? You want a glass of water? Whatever. Yeah. So you might ask, you might ask, uh, John, look, with all of the lack of the trace evidence, that the jury must have seen, and yeah. they did, right? Mr. Conley did a great job. No blood, no fingerprints, no trace, no fiber, nothing, nothing. Right. And when it came time for the prosecutor to address the, that in his closing argument, he told the jury that, look, the reason we don't have any of the trace evidence, that's because that's the way God wanted it. Say that again? Yeah, yeah. As, as the prosecutor was admitting to the jury. That's the way the God wanted argument. The reason we don't have the trace evidence. Because it just wasn't supposed to be there. Because that's the way God wanted it. To well, me now, that's an improper argument, but it wasn't objected to at the time. Okay. But to me, that's, that's why. That's why our law court, when they reviewed the record, and they says, look, we're, after reviewing this voluminous record, we are left with troubling questions. That's exactly what they went on to say. But, How, then, but then they held it, it's okay, though. Well, they so, held that it's okay because 
he had already been found guilty. And so they said, we got, we've got some problems, but we're not going to... Not enough. Not enough. So, because once you've been found guilty by a jury, right. and now you're before the court on appeal, yeah. post-conviction review, yeah. now the standard is you have to prove yourself innocent beyond a reasonable doubt. John. And, and you think you've got the ammunition yeah. to do that at yes, this point Yes, if we in can time. get it in front of a jury again yeah. and put now all of the evidence in. Right. That's the question now. Are we going to be limited in what we can put in for evidence? That's, John, you yeah. just explained something to the audience that I hadn't thought of. And that is when, when people watch a trial, the words reasonable doubt, reasonable doubt, you know, that's all you think about. That's why in the case that was just brought against Trump, they had to make it very clear to the jury, this is preponderance of the evidence. So, Skills of justice like this, all like this, but not beyond a reasonable doubt, which lay like this. And what you're saying is, once the jury comes back with a guilty verdict, by law, you got by it. law, the standard now says to you, you've no longer got the cloak of the presumption of innocence. Exactly. You now have to come before the court and say, Your Honor, they screwed up so bad down right. below that, that we, 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 can, we can prove to you his innocence and we're going to do it this way. And that's how you begin your, your brief and your motion. Talk, Johnny, that's talk, where we are. talk yeah. about your filing. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. You submitted it last week. Yes. All right. Can you kind of summarize yeah. the arguments in here okay. for the audience? So, uh, like, uh, just last week, we filed a, a memorandum. Mm -hmm. The motion is already filed for a new trial. Okay. Now it's a matter of how much evidence can we put in. Because under the DNA statute, it's worded in such a way that we now have to rely on the existing record. What, yeah, tell us what that means, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the existing record. The, the existing record is, I mean, I'm limited to what the witnesses testified to at trial. You can't recross examination We can't recross examine Oh, my God. Okay. So you can't, uh, John, uh, this is important to me uh, as an attorney. You, you, you've got a record. You're, you're the new attorney on here, and you, with the, all this knowledge that you've got, you now, your cross-examination, I assume, would be quite different knowing what you know now Absolutely. than the cross-examination. But you can't change Absolutely. it. You can't say, I can come, because come, that would have to be incompetence of counsel, would it not? Exactly. You'd have exactly. to say, this lawyer never raised this objection. Right. And by the way, John, i got to tell you something. When you made that comment about, you know, only God knows or it's God's will, I have to say to you that if I was defense counsel, I, 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 I'm not sure I would have objected either. I'm not sure I would have said that's the way God wanted it. I, I might have, you know, yeah, whatever. But you're saying you don't have that luxury, do you, John? No. Oh, my God. No, no, the record is already fixed. Right. We, if we're going to convince the judge, we have to convince the judge that the new evidence uh, superimposed on the old ev evidence is going to make a difference to a jury. We can't go back and say, now, wait a minute. Now, when you guys told us that the blood was her own blood, we can't go back and argue that unless we can show it another way. Right. Oh, so my God. Which, you, which is what you're way, doing. Which you sure would have. You would have said, why would she have that much blood under both? What, what was she doing? Just rubbing it? Yeah. yeah see, I, I get you. Yeah. Can't do that. Yeah. Now we're going to be now we're going to be limited. Yeah. yeah. So you've outlined all of this in and, your memo. And then what we're telling the judge here is, is we're telling now, now listen, judge, at the time of trial, the jury was told that the blood under the victim's fingernails was her own blood. Right. We now see that it isn't her own That's blood. That's huge. Okay. Oh, yeah. And we now see that the unknown male blood under the fingernails, uh, the, the DNA, from the from the blood under the fingernails matches the DNA on the scarf. That's powerful. So now, Judge, we can say we can reconstruct this way. He had the scarf. She he had her down on the ground. He put the scarf around her neck twice, knotted it twice. The second time he knotted it, his hands had to be there, and because the scarf was only a normal wood, uh, normal length of a wool scarf. By the time he put it around her twice, he only had about that much left. And that caused his hands to be right there. He had to be that close to her because there was only about six inches of scarf left for him to have his hands on, for him to be tying it. 
and, and, to, and to complete strangulation, you have to maintain asphyxia asphyxiation for about four, five, or six minutes. Excuse me, John. Consistent. Right, John. What you're, this brings up the, 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 the Floyd case, George Floyd. Right. That for that man to, to, and also the recent uh, strangulation in, in the subway. So what you're saying is in order to kill somebody by asphyxiation, strangling them, you can't let up. You, you've got to, you've got to, Constant your, knee, pressure. your knee has got to be on that man's throat. And what you're saying is this man had to spend that much time, a long time, not, you can't just do it in a couple of seconds. No. You, like we see on TV, you strangle somebody, it's a long time. And she's fighting at this and point in time, John. And, and she's fighting, she's doing the only thing she can do with her hands tied here, bound here. Right. And then his hands right above hers, the only thing she could do at that point in time is Was dig. Was use her fingers. And that's what she did. She dug. Yeah. And it's not, it's not the course, Shane's blood. It's right. not the Shane's blood. Not the Shane's blood. No. And of course, she's screaming. She's, she's screaming. You know, that's why he takes her deep, deep into deep the into woods. Deep into the woods, yeah. Uh, yeah. John, one of the questions that we asked, I think the audience needs to know this. Um, and that is, when you take a case like this, people might be wondering, oh my God, he's a, he's a, a big time lawyer and well ex established. You're, when you say, when Rob says pro bono, that means you're doing it for free. Yes. And for either one of two reasons. Either you want to make front page news, or two, you believe in this man's innocence. And what I want to ask you, however, is that even though you're doing it pro bono, who pays for all your experts, John? You can, yeah. I mean, is there a fund out there that people can d donate to or something? Who's paying for all that? Well, well, well you're out. Uh, myself and my co-counsel, Stuart Tisdale, are pro bono. I know Stuart, yes. You know Stuart, great lawyer. Yes. Uh, and then he, but, but Mr. DeShane does have a support group who in the past have raised money for him, and they had a little bit left for us to at least be able to hire the two experts that we have now. We have a DNA expert and we have a crime scene reconstruction expert. Mm -hmm. But we do need more money. There's no doubt about that. There's no money going towards legal fees. We're just thinking that if we're going to move forward, we're going to need money for Expert the expert tes That's testimony. What we need. Yeah. John, I want to say something to the audience that, they, that is important in terms of your, quote, fundraising. That if you yourself start to use your own money uh, from your law firm account, your wife's account, whatever, that unfortunately, as c kind as you are doing that, it also raises a sort of a conflict of interest in that, that you're, you now have a vested financial interest in the case. So if in fact somebody had come up to you and said, you take this case, we'll let you write the book on it, and we'll give you an advance, then that's another, quote, conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. So I think the audience needs to know that the money, money does need to be raised for those forensic expenses so that you can do your job as an attorney without any uh, impropriety Conflict. even thought of. Right, well, he's right. investing in the own case because right. if he wins it, he can do a, 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 a inside addition or something. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, I, I applaud you for that. Yeah, John, talk a little bit about the main uh, judicial uh, system here and there. All along the course of the last 30 some odd years where DeShane has consistently said that he was innocent and in how many attempts to, for trial and appeals and all of that and repeatedly he's been knocked down uh, by the Attorney General's office, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What, what's going on here? Are you getting, are you getting some resistance uh, yeah. as well? And what do you expect the, how, how do you expect the AG will react to this, uh, these new findings and your, your motion for a, for a new hearing? Just as they have reacted to everything this man has tried to do to, to defend himself and to prove himself innocent. Uh, they, they deny, uh, they delay, uh, yeah. they stonewall. Uh, look, we've been 35 years trying to get to where we are now. The right. DNA test results, 35 years. Right. How big was, you know, refresh my re recollection, how big was DNA, DNA 35 years ago? 
It Kurt was Carson. just just beginning, wasn't it? Beginning. That's around the time of OJ, isn't it? I mean, I mean, no, no, no. Uh, 1988 uh, was when a scientist in England finally uh, experimented with it, and they were able to catch the criminal uh, over there uh, by DNA. And then, like, yes, we learned about it maybe 88, 89 coming into vogue, but you gotta know that the forensic community, they're following the development of, of the new technology for years. It might be new to the public. I got you, okay. But in the forensic community, they're seeing it being used, they're seeing it in trials, they're seeing magazine articles. And written, trusted, and, and beginning and, to get trusted. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So in 1989, 1989 was when Tom Connolly filed the motion for testing. Granted, yep. granted, it was new. It was, it was novel, okay? But they were seeing the, the results, okay? And when he was denied at that point in time and then moved forward with it, they were able to develop new science, new technology. Now, in the past, the, the DNA test results were inconclusive because at the, uh, in the past, in like uh, 2000, uh, the way they collected DNA from clothing was they would, they would use a scalpel and scrape it or they would use a wet uh, uh, swab to collect it that way. When they collected the DNA from the scarf and from the T-shirt and from the bra and from other items, it came back inconclusive. Right. Now they have the MVAC wet vac collection system. <laughs> Tell us what that's yeah, all about. Please. So what yeah. that is, it's like a it's like a vacuum that will that they run over the clothing that that uh, sprays water on it to loosen up the DNA particles or whatever might be there, and then it vacuums it up, and then they run it through a filter and then the DNA is separated, and that's how they do it. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what I learned of maybe two years ago, that hey, the, 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 the test results from 2010 were inconclusive, and that's what our law court says, inconclusive. It doesn't help the Shane, it doesn't, doesn't right. change it, the it case just at means all. It right. goes nowhere, it goes nowhere. But then I heard of the MVAC wet vac collection system, so I called the AG's office and I says, look, there's this new technology out there, the MVAC uh, DNA collection system. Would you agree that we should try that now to give this man the DNA, that uh, the and DNA what, what test? Was the and what was the response? You know what I mean? was no, no nail. No, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna agree to that. So then it took me two years to finally get the judge well, not to finally get the judge, but to do the research, because now we had to prove that that new technology was not commonly known and available. Because in order to, in order to have the court order uh, new testing on new technology, we have to have brought the motion within two years of that new technology becoming commonly known and available. Okay. Now at the time I asked, the, the state, if they would agree to it, there is no way that the MVAC collection system was commonly known and available in Maine. Right, yeah. Right. The crime, le crime lab d didn't even have it. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay? Not even close. Well, no, no, stonewalling. Okay. No nail, we're not going to agree to that. This is upsetting. Well, uh, John, my, John. my thought on that is with the DNA testing, <laughs> yeah. look, if they thought that they had such a great case, yeah. Why not just say, hey, we're going to give you all the testing you want. Well, uh, John, exactly. Because we got gotcha. you. I've got to say that, yeah. that that's, that's what's a little surprising for me. Uh, Rob is, uh, is, uh, is good an attorney, but not an attorney. But as an attorney, <laughs> I am somewhat concerned about your, your approach uh, that was basically stonewalled. I mean, their adamants, uh, their adamants of innocence I have to say he served 35 years. Uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is a, a rather personal question about him. For a man to have been just, how do, how do we put this? The horrible fate of being in the wrong place in the wrong time with a, with a perpetrator who, who frames him. I think of myself, John, I think of you, I think of Rob, when we've been alone somewhere 
in in the woods somewhere. I, I you know, hiking somewhere, and 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 to think that you could be doing something with a high or straight, and there's no witnesses to corroborate. There's no George Mitchell, Bill Cohen there to say we were just shooting a bull and fishing together. What I want to say is, how is he doing mentally with this? Is he? I mean, how does he, how does a man cope with all that? Yeah, I know it's it's got to be You can imagine it's very difficult, very difficult. But look, 35 years in prison, which in itself can be a pretty violent place sometimes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Nothing. He's a model inmate. He's a model inmate. They put him in charge of programs. He's running the agricultural program over there. Yeah, he's a model He's trying inmate. to live a regular life. 35 years. Nothing on his record there. And, for the, and, and as a civilian, 30 years, Madawaska, everybody yeah. who knew him in Madawaska just knew him as a great, hardworking kid. Yeah. Nonviolent, never in a fight, nothing. Same thing in prison, 35 years in prison. The same and the thing is, John, thing. if in fact he had a propensity to violence and drugs in prison, he can do both. Oh, he, yeah. can, he can get as many drugs as he wants, and he can be as violent as he wants. And uh, yeah, so you commit one violent murder, which means that you are something wrong with you. You get into prison, that's, that character pretty much comes out. I just want to say to you, John, as a fellow attorney, that you remind me of an attorney of many yesteryears ago. <clears throat> and that attorney was John Adams, who was uh, given the, the unbelievable task of representing the soldiers in the Boston Massacre and, and worked so hard because of his belief in their innocence. I congratulate you for that. Thank you. John Adams, huh? that's pretty good. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> pretty good company. I don't know how much time we have left here. But uh, where are you now with this uh, case, John? You filed your motion. You're, you're waiting for the well, state to get back to you? We're waiting judge? for the state to file a reply memorandum okay. that is going to object with us putting in the, the, the witnesses, uh, the, the additional testimony, the additional uh, crime scene reconstruction. They're going to object to all of that. Why? Because yeah. of the, because the statute the, because the statute allows them to okay okay that's why but like I just said earlier to me if they have such a strong case why not just say hey nail if your client wants more evidence we're, we're gonna we're gonna give it to him if he wants more testing we're gonna give it to him because we think he's the guy I don't know why they're not saying that. And, and we, have have a, we have a tight case now, so go ahead. It's, it's, we'll give him as much testing as he wants. John, the, 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 as I, I keep saying, because I'm thinking of my own experience, that when cases came into my office, whether it be an auto accident case, a criminal case, a divorce case, whatever, I had to make a decision right out, you know, very early. Do I believe 100% of my client that the wife was abused, that the husband did this, or that the husband did that, or that my client was indeed hurt in an auto accident and is not making it up? And you, you form your own beliefs. And what you really hope for in the other side, whether it's an insurance defense attorney or uh, a prosecutor, is that, that you move yourselves toward justice, whatever that may be, with both of you hoping to achieve a result, but this case cannot be settled. Is there any chance, John, that they would just say to you, look, we don't want to go through this work anymore. We're tired of it. You keep bringing it up. He's served 35 years. Is there any chance you could work out a plea bargain where they just let him out? I mean, ser seriously. Is that well, possible? Well, so far, I've asked, uh, on two occasions, I've asked for cooperation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've got none at all. No cooperation from the, from the Attorney General's office at all. No cooperation. That's I with asked, the new Attorney General, the one that's yes, Fry? Yes, yes, yes. No, they're not, well, you, you gotta understand, they are, they're, they're behind this because they made the initial decision that he's guilty. Right. And then, they, and and then they're you, basically gonna, gonna, they're basically gonna, gonna stick with that and say, that in essence, we have a duty to defend the verdict. But they exactly. also have a duty to make sure that somebody who is innocent and serving 35 years uh, with this evidence to at least have a hearing but I'm not and sure. open it up. I, I, I'm not sure I agree with that, Rob. I think that because if, the, if they had a duty, then, then someone would be telling them, you've got a duty to, to, to start cooperating 
Uh, and by the way, John, you know, you're not able to go to a mediator as we are in civil cases, right. where, in a, where the media would say, listen, I'm going to recommend you cooperate on that aspect, uh, you know, give them the evidence, whatever. Don't object to that. But, but what's happening is they are stonewalling because they are, quote, not being, they're not being mean, I guess. They're just, quote, protecting the verdict. Protecting the integrity of the jury verdict. I can understand that. Yes. I, I'm, all, I'm, all, I'm all for that. All for it. Okay, I'm all for that. But as Rob said, we're in favor of defending the jury verdict when we believe that the defendant got a fair trial. Yeah. Here's a man who was asking for DNA testing before the trial. I mean, if that you're innocent, I mean, if you're guilty, you're not going to be asking for that type of testing to be done. I, you know, John, you're not going to be I'm asking say this for to it. You. We have all seen men in prison continue to uh, profess their innocence despite overwhelming evidence we've seen in, in, in politics or whatever. And what you're saying to me is that, that the reason why this case is unique is because this man has consistently said, and you'd think he'd give up after a while because most of them do give up. And, and he has an attorney like you, he had an attorney like Tom Connolly, and I have to say that at some point in time, uh, I'm going to find it hard to believe that a really good judge, you know, I'm not naming any names, but a really good judge is going to say, I got nothing to lose. Give this kid a chance. Give him a chance. Exactly. I mean, that's what I've... you're hoping for. Will you have the same judge, by the way? Will you have, I mean, in these motions, or will you have different judges yeah. moved around? Yeah, same judge, yeah, John. Yeah, yeah, same judge. One, one judge is assigned. Okay, Who is now, it? Bruce Maloney. Yes. Okay. From Bangor, yes. I believe. Yes. Uh, I was going to say, you know, I mean, you, uh, it's, uh, it's a matter of public record, uh, but there is a great deal of pressure on this judge because what's going to happen every time you file a piece of paper, it's front page news, as in the Ayla Reynolds case, which my firm is handling, and you know, all you have to do is file a motion, it's front page news. And so the judge here is going to be, in my opinion, m more watched than any of you. The judge yes. here has got to, got to make a decision, yeah. and if he makes the final decision that no, this kid is going to stay there for the rest of his life, it's, it's pretty much, is it over, John? It's over, isn't it? That, I mean, that's the I question I was going to ask. Yeah, I, I would say no that. No other there's, options, There's no more John? DNA evidence to be collected unless the real and, perpetrator and there's no, there's comes no forward. there's no court that you can appeal to. No court that we can appeal to. No court. The Supreme this Court. Is, John, this is your last chance right here. This is right. Deshane's last yeah, chance. Deshane's last yeah. chance. Right? I say yeah. yours, meaning you can't bring him. it to the yeah. Supreme Court, John. Well, maybe if there's a constitutional issue, right. you can bring okay. it to the U.S. Right. Supreme Court. Right. But I mean, we're not there yet on any of that. I don't see it. But well, let's hope uh, that. Well, John, I have to tell you that in reading that very briefly in, in, in a cursory manner, but your explanation earlier before we came on the show was actually so well formulated. And I, I got to tell you, what I'm also impressed with is your knowledge of this case because, it, you know, you would have had to read volumes of material. And, you know, I got to ask you, John, we all think about the attorney on the hourly basis. You've got, like, tons of hours in this case, do you not? Oh, yeah. Do you keep track of your time, by the way? No. No, because if you did, <laughs> my uh, wife might. But yeah, I know. Got? Five minutes, okay. Uh, can, can I ask a question? Uh, sure can, yeah. Just uh, <laughs> can you kind of paint a picture uh, for the audience, graphically telling them, you know, what your what your what your case is, John? Why he's innocent? Just paint that picture because I I think the way you do it is is very vivid, and uh, I, I'd like to leave the audience with that impression. Yeah. In other words, basically, yeah, tell us how. Yeah. So, so I guess there, uh, I would say that uh, I believe that he was framed. Yep. Okay. That's important. I believe that he was framed. By the way, John, I have to interrupt you here because I, I wanted to ask this question. Would they have any idea of anybody living near that girl, who it might be? Did they ever have any possibilities? Tom Connolly did. He did. Tom Connolly did have an alternative suspect theory, but when you're denied the DNA test results, you Which don't was, have much to go on right. in order to bring that third-party suspect in. Okay, go That's ahead. That's what they lost. Go ahead. I interrupted so, you. So, 
framed. Go ahead. Oh, okay, okay, so I, I'm seeing it that he was framed. I'm saying that we have two victims here. We have the young 12-year-old girl and we have Mr. DeShane. We have two victims. And I'm saying that the uh, prosecution, uh, when they got involved in the case and they relied so heavily just on the circumstantial evidence and hurried to bring the case to trial because the community wanted the, we, they wanted a conviction. That's in the record. Mm -hmm. Now here's a case that was only seven months old before it went to trial. That's pretty quick. That's quick. Today I read in the Waterville Morning Sentinel of a case that went to trial that was three years old. Mm -hmm. So seven months old is, is quick. So them knowing or believing that they had the right man knowing that the community wanted an answer to it. They focused on this man here, they put the blinders on, and they railroaded him. They denied him the DNA evidence up front. They denied it to him after the trial, and as a matter of fact, after the trial, they wanted to destroy the evidence. And then what we have is, is we have them stonewalling him for, 10, for 35 years. And the stonewalling comes in by them denying, denying, denying. And as I said here, when it, comes, when it comes to the DNA on the fingernails, they're willing to throw their own lab under the bus. <laughs> to blame it on their own lab. Which mm -hmm. I find that, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the strangest things. So that's where I'm coming from, right there. Well, right. Uh, John, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna wrap up. Uh, we've been given the, the, the warning. I just want to commend you again, my comparison to John Adams, because I remember watching, well, yeah, what's it like when you go, hey, listen, you got two sides of the case. He's a lot better looking than John Adams. Uh, you are. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that way, we don't really know, but Giamatti played him in, on the TV series. But um, what I want to do is tell the audience that uh, we know you folks uh, enjoyed the show we did on uh, about Donald Trump. And we are having, indeed, David Jones back. Uh, you might as well have Trump on the show because he knows everything about him. And we're also going to have, most likely, a DeSantis fan because this thing is going to heat up. And Rob and I really enjoy, uh, we're going to enjoy watching uh, DeSantis and Trump go at it uh, by bringing those two people back. But our next show, uh, after J John's show runs, is going to be a show uh, much lighter than today's topic, uh, a show about the temptations because the Temptations came to Portland, and uh, Dino, we're gonna send you a picture that I want you to put up. It's a picture of Rob and I uh, with the with Temptations. The temptations. Uh, we were invited backstage, specifically you and I, because we're such heroes, to meet with the Temptations, and we met with the original uh, Otis Williams, who was the founder of the Temptations. Correct. And we have a, a very personal friend of the Temptations uh, that will be on our show, Maria Novi. Uh, and we'll also do a little it's discussion on his and my involvement with Bobby Rydell. But so, The Temptations, we saw, did you like that show, Bob? Loved it. Yeah. I loved it. Oh, and The Four Tops. Yeah, well, so. The Four Tops were there. And of course, great music. We, we gave our guest a front row seat. So she was touching The Temptations and The Four Tops and shaking hands and stuff. Rob and I were in the back. Cheap seats. <laughs> back row, back <laughs> balcony. But the good news is, Rob, you were able to take video because people... I did. <laughs> they don't want you to take video to Merrill, which, by the way, I think they're wrong about that. I think if the band allows you to take video, you can take video. Right. And most bands today, Taylor Swift, whatever, they don't mind that kids are doing the videos. They no. really don't. They're all out there with the videos. So, but anyway, so you got some video. We're going to show you the temptations. And, John, thank you again for yes, coming John, this was, on this case. I, uh, we wish you the best of luck. This is, this is important. I... Right. I think you, you presented a hell of a case uh, for our viewers, for us. Frankly, Rob, uh, I would say I got a reasonable doubt. If Amen. you're going to present what you're going to present, oh my God, I yes. think there's a shot of reasonable doubt. And if there's a shot of a reasonable doubt, and I mean a really reasonable doubt, then I think hopefully the judge will go your way. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching the Runlet and Baldacci Report with our guest, John Nail on the Dennis DeShane case. We'll see you again. Thank you. that but i'll be back thank you for tuning in to the hollywood godfather podcast want to ask us a question for the mailbag we love hearing from our fans so submit your questions online at hollywoodgodfatherpodcast.com or you can give us a call at 646-776-3038 and leave a message 
Contact us anytime with your questions about past or future shows, your favorite celebrity, or anything you'd like to know. And who knows, your question may even make it on the air. Remember to follow us on Instagram and on Facebook at Hollywood Godfather and at Real Johnny Russo. If you like what you hear, please leave us a review with your podcast provider or your video streaming service. We'll be back next week with another exciting show and who knows who we may have on the show. If you don't want to miss out on an episode, remember to subscribe. Until next time. My life's like scenes out of a movie. I'm the Hollywood Godfather, truly. I got stories with them all. You know, celebrities, world leaders, icons. Who knows what's next for me? I'll never get too old to have a little fun. Come on, I'm Gianni Russo. A genuine one of a kind. What a ride it's been, this life of mine. And I ain't done yet. I'll be back until next time. And that was that. When I was seventeen, it was a very good year. It was a very good year for small town girls and soft summer nights. We'd hide from the light on the village green when I was seventeen. I didn't mind